Hello everyone, thank you so much for joining me today. For today's video, we have Rivian's first quarter 2023 earnings to go through, and we also have some giant, really big Twitter news, and I have chapters below in case you wanna to go to either section first or second. So without further ado, let's go ahead and get started. In case you're not familiar, Rivian is a manufacturer of, of electric pickup trucks and SUVs. They launched in 2021. This is their R1T, which is the pickup truck, a pretty sweet looking car, honestly. I've been seeing a lot of them uh, around the Austin area here in Texas, uh, and this is their uh, SUV solution, which is a three row SUV. And uh, it looks like they're growing this bu their business nicely. They're still losing quite a bit of money but I really want to go through the different sections to get you up to speed on how Rivian is performing thus far. So in the first quarter of 2023, Rivian produced 9,395 units and they delivered 7,946. If you look at their uh, performance quarter over quarter since Q1 of 2022 through Q1 of 2023, the red line is their deliveries and the blue line is production. So they've been ramping up real nicely through the end of the previous year in 2022 with a little bit of a, a flip flat line for the last quarter, given that they were working on some stuff at the factory and at different areas as well. So they're trying to smooth out their scale for the next of the year. The company's targeting for 50,000 units produced in 2023. If you look at their performance year over year, they grew deliveries by over 260%, but quarter over quarter, they're down about 6% due to some of those shutdowns at the factory to upgrade some of their lines. Their average selling price for their trucks and the SUV is around $83,000. However, given that they're a new company, they're still losing quite a bit of money. Rivian loses about $180,000 thousand dollars per car sold however this is a giant improvement from the 1.2 million dollars they were losing per car sold in the first quarter of 2022 so still a lot of money but an improvement just like any other brand new ev automaker or like lucid or ford which we review on this channel that we see they're struggling a lot to create profit around electric vehicles and rivian is another one but they are improving, so this is a good sign. Uh, this equates to about a cr gross profit, which is basically how much money they make on the car itself, uh, uh, just from a percentage perspective and money perspective, a gross profit of negative $535 million total for the first quarter, and a gross profit percentage, which is a percentage of their revenue that's basically gross profit, is negative 81%. Obviously, you want this to be in the positives, but it's negative. If you look at their gross profit quarter over quarter, this is Q1 of 2022 through Q1 of 2023. This is zero, and so this is negative. These are negative amounts. So you can kind of see that their uh, first quarter 2023 gross profit is, is equaling their previous year Q1, but they're shipping a lot more cars. So this is not necessarily a terrible thing, and it's a very big improvement from Q2, Q3, and Q4 of last year. This is the gross profit percentage. So the percentage of the money they're losing as a uh, as compared to their revenue or how much they sold the cars for you can see that even though it's negative 81 percent it's been improving quite a bit since q1 of 2022 so this is obviously a great trend for the company so gross margins are improving dramatically to do scale there they have a factory and they're pushing more cars to that factory and that's allowing them to lower their cost per unit which is allowing them to increase their gross profit percentage again still negative but at least it's getting better their operating income, which is basically how much money they make or lose, wants to take into account all costs from the business, not just from building the car, but like things like R&D, back office worker, R&D meaning research and development, so on and so forth. They lost about $1.4 billion in the quarter, which equates to an operating margin of neg negative 217% once you include those costs. Again, very similar to what was happening with the gross profit, but thus far, between Q1 2022 through Q1 in 2023, their operating income in dollars is actually the best it's been since Q1 of 2022, where they lost about $1.5 billion, but they've improved it somewhat to that 1.4 billion, but they're still losing a ton of money quarter over quarter. Their operating margin though, similarly to their gross profit percentage is improving dramatically from the first quarter of 2022, and it's still improving up to that negative 200%, but still a long way to go for the company to be profitable. Their cash and cash equivalents, which is basically how much liquid cash Rivian has on hand, is about $11.2 billion on their balance sheet, which is significantly higher than, say, Elucid, which has around, I believe, $900 million in just cash, but uh, but significantly less than a Tesla that has like $24, I believe, billion dollars, and a Ford, which has like $28. So they're halfway there, but as a startup automaker, it's actually a lot of cash on hand. So this is great for the long-term survival. Oops. 
If we want to see the trend from Q1 of 2022, they started with about 16 billion in cash and has been going down quarter over quarter as they've been ramping up their production and spending in research and development and things to make the factory go faster. It hasn't gone down too much from Q4, but it's still down from their 16 billion that they started with in the first quarter of 2022. But again, it's a brand new automaker. You would expect them to have that certain level of difficulty ramping. So their cash is about 2.8% lower quarter over quarter and about 31% lower year over year, Q1 2022 versus Q1 2023. Now let's go through some of the comments from the call. Uh, I listened to the entire earnings call for you and I wanted to make sure I captured really the highlights that I thought were interesting and I'll bring them over to you and see if you find them interesting. And while you're watching, if you're enjoying this content, I would love it if you throw me a like. It helps the YouTube algorithm show those to more people. Thank you so much. And we can all nerd out together. Look at that. Beautiful. <laughs> so the, uh, the company is guiding to positive gross profit, not positive operating income, which is the total business, but basically the cost associated to building the car versus how much they sell it for. They expect the, uh, the gross profits to be positive by the end of 2024. So they've guided, or I believe they re-guided this for their uh, investors, which is about seven to eight quarters from now. And their backlog, which is how many customers they have that are waiting to get their cars delivered, uh, they're saying that it extends into 2024. So theoretically, after they produce their 50,000 units this year and however many units they produce uh, in 2024, the 50,000 for this year should be bought, but we'll see if they're remainder will be bought into next year into 2024. So we'll see how far that backlog will extend. And they also made a comment that the cash balance they have will fund them through 2025, no problem. Of course, if they're able to start making some money up through then, then theoretically, they won't have to raise any more cash. But there could be a situation that if Rivium burns through too much cash by releasing their SUV and additional products, that they might be in a situation where they have to raise cash. But at least the money they have now will keep them alive through the end uh, through 2025. And they think half of the improvement for that gross profit going up to positive in 2024 will come from scale, which basically means that maximizing the amount of units that go through the factories to make as much money as humanly possible. They have a lot of uh, robots and people just kind of standing around can, that they, they can do more work. And so they have to continue to work on that to get uh, to positive plus other things as well. So that's one of the things that highlighted on the call regarding Rivian. Uh, they're for the long term, so when they're fully ramped and they have the factory really nailed in and they're generating enough demand, uh, Rivian's targeting 25% gross profits and high teens net income percentage, which are sort of similar to what Tesla has been doing historically. Just to give you an idea, Rivian has a very similar target for their business, probably at much lower volumes, probably in the 100,000 or so or 200,000 volume <laughs> number as my chihuahua goes crazy. But the amount of money they'll make from those cars from a percentage perspective should be similar to Tesla in case you want a comparison. And then Rivian is also working on level two and level three autonomy solutions, which is basically advanced uh, autonomy solutions, but it doesn't really allow you to not pay attention. Very similar to what autopilot and full self-driving are today in Tesla cars, Rivian is working towards that solution uh, in the future for their next generation platform, which is called the R2 and the R1 as well. I believe from the call, they said they're going to look to release something similar for those cars. I'll have to double check, but I believe that's the case. One of the questions that was on the call was, would you cut prices and make it up on the back end, which is basically something similar to what Tesla is doing with their cars, where they're lowering the prices on their cars and they're saying, hey, once our full self-driving software goes live, we'll be able to make our money back once people you know, start buying that finished product. That same exact question was brought to Rivian, and their answer was that for the current pl platform, that's not the case, which tells me that level two, level three autonomy stuff probably will be reserved for the next platform, but as a business evolves, maybe. And that was a very interesting comment. Maybe on a call basically means yes, <laughs> if it's positive for the business, I found, but execution is a whole different story. So so that was a very interesting comment and I'm hearing this comment around Tesla's price strategy basically on every single automaker call. So what Tesla did with the car from a pricing perspective is quite 
is shaking is shaking the ground a little bit in the auto, automotive business, which is fascinating to watch. Tesla's price decreases are setting the industry standard for the future of vehicles. I, I believe this is truly the case, maybe not today, but as cars continue to evolve, I really think we're going to get into a model where the car itself is going to be as cheap as humanly possible, and then the type of software the automaker gives you will allow them to make more money on the back end, and then people can pick and choose what kind of software they want on their car, which is moving us towards a more digital experience with the car. Let me know how you think about that, uh, what you think about that in the comment section uh, below. There was also a comment around uh, legacy competition. What does Rivian think of legacy competition? They're coming out with the F-150 Lightning. Ram's coming out with their electric uh, solution as well. And Rivian's comment was, everything in the future will be electric. What's the way the product comes together? That's the bigger question, right? Between software and hardware. And this really outlines, I really think Rivian's uh, uh, forward thinking nature in building a vehicle, which I think is lacking from legacy auto from most of the players. So to me, this says that Rivian is fully aware of the marriage of hardware and software. And I really believe this sets them up very well into the future if they're able to execute on this marriage correctly. And that was a very good thing to hear from their uh, investing group. Rivian is very optimistic about its long-term prospects, was kind of the overarching tenor of the call, sort of how people were speaking, the executives were speaking, a very drastic difference between this call and the Lucid call from yesterday, if you follow my video from yesterday. These guys sounded pretty confident, they knew what they had to do. Lucid sounded a little bit a little bit desperate, and I understand given that they only have $900 million of, uh, dollars in sort of cash and they're burning through it really, really quickly. So, uh, you know, Rivian sounded very confident and honestly, so am I. <laughs> I'm not an investor in Rivian. I'm not short Rivian, but it's a company that I follow very closely because I really want to understand what the rest of the automotive sector is doing since I follow electrification and really the broader auto market very closely. So props to Rivian. I think I think the call was good. They had good report uh, from as far as earnings go. Their stock was up about 5% after hours after I, I checked right before I came on this video. And so the future looks good. They just have to keep executing and get to profitability as quickly as humanly possible. Truly a stark contrast from Lucid. So I'm really curious to monitor these uh, companies hand by hand and see how far they can go into the future. So now we're going to get on into our huge Twitter news. Really, really groundbreaking. I think this has a lot of implications uh, and it's going to be quite the sight to behold and, you know, and see what's going to happen here in the coming months, really, uh, potentially weeks. If you do want to support me, I do have a Twitter handle at Farziness. I've been on Twitter for more than a decade, crazily enough. So I have a lot of stupid stuff on there. <laughs> but if you do want to follow me there and support me there as well, I do have subscriptions open. So if you'd like to do that, uh, I would really appreciate your support. Thank you so much. Really appreciate you. So the big news, Tucker Carlson, who's uh, one of the largest uh, cable news personalities, is bringing his show to Twitter. I don't know if you follow US uh, news quite closely, but Tucker apparently was fired from Fox, still kind of unclear what's going on there, but he just made an announcement on Twitter that he's bringing his show to Twitter. He gets about 3.5 million viewers uh, on average, or used to on Fox, so he has quite a big draw on cable news, and he was the highest rated cable news show before he was let go or left Fox, still unclear what happened. Uh, but he's a he's a very big personality, very big talent on that side of the world that's now coming on Twitter. Uh, let's go ahead and watch his announcement from Twitter in case you haven't watched it yet, so we can listen to it together and kind of give you my thoughts after we watch it. Hey, it's Tucker Carlson. You often hear people say the news is full of lies, but most of the time that's not exactly right. Much of what you see on television or read the New York Times is in fact true in the literal sense. It could pass one of the media's own fact checks. Lawyers would be willing to sign off on it. In fact, they may have. But that doesn't make it true. It's not true. At the most basic level, the news you consume is a lie, a lie of the stealthiest and most insidious kind. Facts have been withheld on purpose, along with proportion and perspective. You are being manipulated. How does that work? Let's see. If I tell you that a man has been unjustly arrested for armed robbery, that is not, strictly speaking, a lie. He may have been framed. At this point, there's been no trial, so no one can really say. But if I don't mention the fact that the same man has been arrested for the same crime six times before, am I really informing you? No, I'm not. I'm misleading you. And that's what the news media are doing in every story that matters, every day of the week, every week of the year. What's it like to work in a system like that? 
After more than 30 years in the middle of it, we could tell you stories. The best you can hope for in the news business at this point is the freedom to tell the fullest truth that you can. But there are always limits. And you know that if you bump up against those limits often enough, you will be fired for it. That's not a guess. It's guaranteed. Every person who works in English language media understands that. The rule of what you can't say defines everything. It's filthy, really, and it's utterly corrupting. You can't have a free society if people aren't allowed to say what they think is true. Speech is the fundamental prerequisite for democracy. That's why it's enshrined in the first of our constitutional amendments. Amazingly, as of tonight, there aren't many platforms left that allow free speech. The last big one remaining in the world, the only one, is Twitter, where we are now. Twitter has long served as the place where our national conversation incubates and develops. Twitter is not a partisan site. Everybody's allowed here, and we think that's a good thing. And yet, for the most part, the news that you see analyzed on Twitter comes from media organizations that are themselves thinly disguised propaganda outlets. You see it on cable news. You talk about it on Twitter. The result may feel like a debate, but actually the gatekeepers are still in charge. We think that's a bad system. We know exactly how it works, and we're sick of it. Starting soon, we'll be bringing a new version of the show we've been doing for the last six and a half years to Twitter. We'll be bringing some other things too, which we'll tell you about. But for now, we're just grateful to be here. Free speech is the main right that you have. Without it, you have no others. See you soon. So as you can see from the video, Tucker will be coming on Twitter to really move his show and what he usually covers, I'm guessing, to Twitter. They might do some new stuff as well. But I really believe this is really good news for Twitter and its long-term prospects. The fact that they're able to bring one of the, really the, the highest rated cable news person onto Twitter after this whole ordeal happened is a big deal. Politics aside, it's gonna bring a ton of viewers to the platform, which I think it's gonna be very positive for the platform's long-term success. Now, this move could be politically divisive if diverse voices don't go on the platform long-term. You know, if only, say, right-of-center folks will come on the on the platform. It might not really align with Twitter's long-term vision of being welcoming to everybody, but I think this signals that people that have a huge following are willing to go to Twitter, and this obviously is great news for Twitter's long-term success. Twitter should be welcoming to everyone was a slogan that Elon Musk himself said about Twitter, and so this is a great first step to get the ball rolling for really large audiences to start coming onto Twitter, and the diversity of those voices, I think it's gonna be very, very important to really maximize this slogan becoming truly True, if that makes any sense. Um, expect more high caliber talent to join the platform with exclusive content from varying backgrounds and politics would be my overarching message based on this move. We'll see what happens here uh, as the weeks and months go by, but it's, it's this is truly a big deal when it comes to to mainstream media and, and Twitter sort of how it's playing in that arena, in the arena of media, quite, quite a big development. And really <laughs> one of the underlying things here is that Twitter's path to profitability has probably accelerated dramatically as that's gonna bring a lot of additional eyeballs where Twitter is gonna be able to dramatically increase its uh, ad revenue from. And uh, overall, this is gonna be a, a huge thing. When 3.5 million people are willing to watch uh, a, a person for an hour, the ad revenue there is a lot. And so I think from that perspective, Twitter is super positioned to uh, really take advantage of that. And it really does appear that legacy media is being disrupted by Twitter with this thing happening. This is quite quite a shocking thing. I think, I think very few people expected this to happen, but it does seem like legacy media is being disrupted by this move. And it gives a lot of sort of a credibility to Twitter as a platform for somebody to come on. And so if you really think about this within the context of Elon Musk, how he's disrupted rocketry with SpaceX, how he's disrupted automotive with Tesla, are we seeing disruption in mainstream media with Twitter now <laughs> with these moves? One of the things I really tried to wrap my head around when the Twitter acquisition was announced uh, over a year ago now was that, hey, I expect this to sort of follow a similar trend than SpaceX and Tesla, but in the mainstream media arena. And this might be the first step of that becoming true, but I'd love to hear your thoughts uh, in, in the comment section below. So what do you think? What do you think about Twitter? What do you think about Tucker Carlson moving over there? Do you think Twitter is well positioned to really take advantage of this move? What do you think of Rivian's earnings? Do you think they're set up to be super successful long-term or do 
do think it's going to be another Lucid potentially, <laughs> you know, fingers crossed for Lucid truly. Uh, but if you want to watch more content from me that covers varying topics around the world of tech, automotive and things like that, feel free to subscribe. I try to do my, my videos as informative and, and as helpful as humanly possible. And I try to be either unbiased or be very clear about my biases. So uh, I really do appreciate your support. And if you want to support the channel by purchasing some merch, I have a link for that in the description below that takes you to my website to buy some shirts, hats, hoodies, all that good stuff. Thank you so much for watching today. I hope this was informative and helpful and we'll see you on the next one. Take it easy, everybody. Bye-bye.